insurance and more. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Ask the Plan Man. I'm your host, Bruce Weinstein, and I believe each and every one of us have the right to proper planning. Whether it's a financial plan, a college plan, an estate plan, an exit plan for your business, a health and nutrition plan. We've had plenty of episodes just talking about health and wellness. Well, today we're going to talk about building relationships and what happens when your planning hits the chaotic walls. And I'm joined today by Greg Gray, and I'm going to just reference Greg's beautiful bio here. He's the founder and CEO of Greg Gray, Inc., a professional and personal leadership coach firm based in Atlanta, Georgia. He's one of the most sought after speakers on the training and uh, sorry, speaking and training circuit today. Greg is internationally renowned. He's an expert on leadership, sales, relationship building, and the customer experience. He keynotes seminars and workshops have electrified and empowered tens of thousands of people in over 500 cities. I bet he's got a couple of air miles built up over there. He's been in America. He's been in the Caribbean. He's been in Europe. He's been in the Pacific Rim. His humor and uh, real life practical ideas in leadership service and relationship building are receiving rave reviews from clients that run the gamut of industries and different associations. Greg's a three-time author, author with a fourth book coming. He co-authored the largest customer service training manual in U.S. history entitled Excellent Service, Handle with Care, which guess what? That's for the postal community. Over 110,000 postal employees have been through that video training that Greg and his co-author put together many years back. He's also authored two books himself, Getting There and Staying There, The People Side of Sustained Operational Excellence, and his third book, Dad from a Distance, How a Non-Custodial Father Can Be a Fantastic Dad. Uh, I can certainly relate to that. And his new book we'll touch on is Wake Me When It's Over, why so many presentations suck, but yours doesn't have to. And, and, and again, that resonates with me as well, because I've been doing that kind of work for uh, the, since the 90s as well. But So, Greg, welcome to the show. What what we wanted to get going on, we, we've I've said it on the show in the past, everybody has a plan. We're going to quote Mike Tyson. Everybody has a plan till they get punched in the face. And so one of the things that you've shared, you speak of in your circuits is dealing with the chaos when plans go awry, and how that could create other opportunities. So why don't you kind of share some of that with us? So, uh, absolutely. And thank by the way, you read that bio almost exactly the way my mother put it together. So I'm sure you would be very pleased. <laughs> Mama Gray did good. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. So thanks for having me. Right, I have a right mind. <laughs> she does pretty good at that copywriting thing, I'm just saying. Excellent. Um, so, but thanks for having me on, and I think this is... Uh, a really important topic for um, business owners. I think it's also a big topic for people who are trying to make sure their families stay on track, friendships. Uh, we talked a little bit in the run-up to this uh, talk today about the fact that relationships are key to everything. Um, all of the greatest opportunities are found through relationships. The challenges, that's probably also where our biggest challenge is are also found is in relationships. But as it relates, as you mentioned, to planning, uh, so a little bit, uh, I'll roll the tape back a little bit. So yeah, please. for about, since 1993, I've actually owned a speaking and training firm. So basically my life for, and you mentioned the frequent flyer miles, it's a little over two million of them. If oh you boy. Can that. <laughs> um, so my life was getting on a plane, always getting on 99 percent of what i did uh, involved travel so sure. getting on a plane going to hotels and then uh, spending uh, large amounts of time in very crowded rooms with people in very close quarters uh, and then reversing and coming back home so that was the thing that's where all those 500 cities and all that kind of stuff came from and then you probably heard of that little thing called the pandemic a couple of years ago which uh let pretty much every element of the way my business works dead hold dashed against the rocks. Yeah, dead hold. Uh, in fact, I remember on March 15th, I was in Ohio uh, doing a seminar for the Judicial College of Ohio. So these are magistrates, court clerks, judges, and all these folks. 500 people there, Bruce. And that afternoon, 
the governor of Ohio announced that there will be no gatherings above 100 people. And so we started this, uh, started the day with 500 people, and within 45 minutes, no one was in the hotel. They had to kick 400 people I out. Have been shut down. <laughs> yes. And uh, over the next four or five days, I probably got a dozen calls from clients that had hired me to do, you know, workshops. There are other events. That, all of them canceling. So I had this, the entire pipeline, salespeople understand pipeline, by the way, that you're always trying to keep the next thing going. So it just all disappeared, literally disappeared. The entire way that I earned uh, my living uh, just vanished. And, uh, and it vanished for a minute because, as we know, it took a while before things started opening up, depending on what part of the country you're in. And, so, and even when it did, uh, what I found interesting, and you may have seen this too, Bruce, uh, with um, the, some of the conventions and conferences that people go to, is that even when things opened up, a lot of people were still not good about going. So you found all of a sudden there was all these hybrid conferences starting to happen where right. people were doing things part live. In fact, that was almost all. Most people never heard of Zoom before about uh, March of 2020, uh, and then it became a thing. Um, but that presented an interesting challenge. What do I do now? And there are a lot of people that didn't, uh, you know, that are watching this that did not have that specific thing, but they did run into a wall and all of a sudden, somebody just turned the faucet off. Well, if, if you're, and what do we do now? If you're a local presence in your community, you're in the chambers, you're in networking groups, the B and I's and the like, everything just kind of went and had to, had to do a yeah. 180. And so for us, the Zoom and the Zoom technology became the new way of life, which for better or for worse, it, it kept your activity level high. You got to maybe meet people in other markets you wouldn't have been meeting if it was local, but at the same time, the intimacy factor is just never the same. And so there's that trade-off volume and flexibility versus the intimacy. So you and I have never met in person. We've been in some group settings together and gotten to know each other. And we, we have a nice working relationship, but we don't necessarily have that deeper intimacy if that we were having lunch for a couple of hours and you know, there's there's just a different human interaction in person. And so yeah. it, it, it the chaos that you're referring to is everything's turned upside down, right? Everybody's paradigm is now shattered. And so yeah. adjusting to that, and like you said before, not everybody likes the Zoom, wants to be on the Zoom. They, they don't know what to do with it. They're, they're wearing their underwear. <laughs> the dog's barking. Like they don't treat it professionally. We've also heard some of the other misgivings of people <laughs> doing things when the camera was still on you know well i mean it became a meme i mean zoom yeah. meetings uh became almost as popular as uh some of the memes and pictures from some box stores that will yeah. go unnamed <laughs> uh, but this is the point though bruce um in terms of the opportunity because out of chaos can come opportunity you mentioned that we've never met in person but we met because of a mutual relationship. That's right. And that mutual relationship brought us to the same space. And here we are now, and, and you know, I have done podcasts before, not only as a host, but as a guest. I understand how important it is not to put the wrong people on your podcast. But even through this virtual relationship we have, we formed enough of a relationship that you would trust that this would work for your audience. And uh, one of the things, and you mentioned it, that, that I think is really key, and I, I'm speaking kind of through my own experience, but people can kind of extrapolate from this for their experience. So I'm a speaker. I go out and I speak, that's what I do. Um, and then I can't do that. What I found, however, was that in my sphere of influence uh, or my in my vocation I found out pretty quickly Bruce that there were a lot of people that were dynamic speakers in person but on a zoom fell completely flat <laughs> I mean pretty big name people and so I spotted that pretty quickly because when you go to conferences very often you're in the queue or you're kind of watching as a panelist to see sure. what's going on 
And I'm thinking, okay, so I might be able to excel in a place where other people are not excelling because mm. they're just not familiar with the technology. So I became a real student of the technology and how do I get people to engage and how do I get people to use the chat feature when some meetings people said don't use the chat you know how do I use the emojis how do I engage people on a zoom meeting rather than just having them watch basically almost watch a video and those were the opportunities when your antenna are up when you meet chaos there's always another place to go there's mm -hmm. always another place to be able to show up and those relationships that you have before chaos and you alluded to this Bruce and I want to highlight what you said because I think it's spot on uh, it would have been too late to form relationships in the middle of chaos because <laughs> everybody had their own sure uh, you know, they're their hunkered down uh, box to carry right yeah it was the relationships that um, pre-existed or uh, that were there before the chaos that allowed me to navigate the chaos and you said that earlier so I just wanted to give extra voice to it because sometimes we forget that's, uh, it, you know, I don't care how smart I am, if I don't have anybody to be able to lean on or connect me to other people, it doesn't matter how good I can navigate Zoom because I'm never on Zoom with anybody except myself. <laughs> right. So, um, the, yeah, so I, I, I want to just kind of interject a little bit. So yeah. I, I get it from, I've done years and years of workshops, financial planning seminars that I've run and speaking to an audience. And I feed off of the crowd. I get to know who's sitting there. You, you remember a couple of names when they come in, so you could start calling on them and interacting. And and the energy level just goes up. I'm more engaged. They're more engaged. I'm already picking up how many times you've used my name, you know, in in the conversation. It didn't didn't uh, skip over me. Like I'm catching it. I'm not using your name as much. It's not something I I have a big habit, but I know you do. But again, j folks, listen. Like these are small pointers. Like as a professional, you could already pick up. Greg's been implementing here. So what what you were saying is the energy levels when a Grand Cardone gets in the room with ten thousand people and the music's blasting and he's feeding off of that energy is way different than when he's going to go into a studio by himself and a microphone and and have nobody else to talk to and yeah. that's part of my hurdles my producers want me to do solo shows as part of the podcast themes talk about client challenges and and just talk and you know if you look at what i have released so far there's only one and it's flat i can't just talk to the camera and and sit there and now it have to be scripted with with things i need to make sure i'm saying and the so what's and the whiffums and the dynamic in my energy is way different than now i'm looking at greg i'm feeding off of greg i'm spontaneous maybe there's a little joke or a quip you can kind of interact on because but i'm good on my feet you're good on your feet and so i think where you're getting at with this is not everybody has that spontaneity ability to adjust on the fly, and maybe that's where they kind of fell flat, adjusting yeah. to the new, the new I'm paradigm. I'm gonna challenge you, Bruce. Yeah, come I'm on. I'm gonna challenge you on what you said, and uh, which probably will not get me invited back. Ah, uh, you're, you're already invited back. Um, the things that work and make, for example, video presentations work better are tactical things. Hmm. So they aren't natural, you know, oh, you just have a gift for being able to do that. They, they are just like you teach people how to plan uh, for, uh, you know, how they should be thinking about their retirement or how they should be thinking about the insurance or how they're protected or whether they have an umbrella and all these things that you talk to people about. Um, everything can have a, a similar blueprint. I can teach you the things that I'm talking about. and. That was one of the things that never existed for me before. So you mentioned the, the upcoming book, why, why, you know, wake me when it's over, why so many presentations suck and yours don't have to, right? So I've been doing that presentation for years. After the pandemic, an entirely different segment of that presentation emerged mm. because people were saying, well, help me do better when I'm just looking at a camera. Uh, because, for example, Zoom meetings are a little easier because you can see all the boxes. But very often, the boxes just have names in them. 
So even if you're on a Zoom meeting, you don't, you can't see people laughing, you can't see their leaning, you know, all those, um, those signals that you were talking sure, sure. about. Sure, sure, body language, use. yeah. But you can be taught to do those types of things. And so now, out of the chaos, I, four years ago, me teaching a class on how to be more engaging as a presenter in a virtual environment was not on my radar. Right. But now it's one of the things that I get some of the most requests for, even though we're coming out of the pandemic, because a lot of business meetings are still, Absolutely. you know, companies are figured out. I don't have to send, you know, Bruce and Greg all the way to Arizona for three days to, for a two hour meeting. We just put them on a Zoom. Yeah. I can save all that money, but I don't want to lose the impact of the meeting. So um, you said that's not what you do, but there's a lot of people that have been watching your podcast that what you're teaching them is not what they do but now it is because they've been taught that and that is a that's by virtue of figuring out the next thing what is the next thing and relationships are what help you get there because i just ask people where are people hurting what are the things we need to be doing right and they told me and now it's become almost uh an outgrowth of the, some of the offerings i do so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, as you're saying this, I'm picturing, if you remember the TV show, One Day at a Time and the character Schneider, right? Yes. John John Harrington, I think maybe was. Yes. And so I'm, I'm just picturing Schneider. So those of you who haven't ever seen the show, he walks around with the big tool belt all the time. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I'm saying this is Greg's putting things out there where what's resonating to me is he's talking about adding tools to the toolbox. Right. And so the, the pivot and the, the opportunities are, well, I could learn this. You, you've seen a new problem, and that's getting off a stage and in person to being in a Zoom and a different setting. Well, you know what? I need to develop those skill sets, and now I need, and I can train other people who are asking for those skill sets, and that skill set is more tools for their toolbox. And Absolutely. so- and you, you know what's really cool? is just what happened to my in-person presentations as a result. They hopefully elevated. they, I say, hopefully, they, yeah, they, they elevated. Absolutely. Because there were things I was doing just like there's things that you can do with your eyes closed. And unfortunately, sometimes that's how we do them yeah. <laughs> with our eyes closed. I drive, but, but I get yelled at. So yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> and you should be, you should be yelled at for that. <laughs> hey, wake up. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Safety first, everybody. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, the, but, the, the, the show more exciting because you could, you could revisit the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis and really elevate those things too. Yeah, no, 100%. All I was going to just put, put the rubber stamp on was the the purpose with the show and the segments of my show in the different areas of the planning finance stuff is these are all tools. They're tools for people's toolboxes. So you may, you may already have certain things covered or taken care of but yet you're like, oh, I didn't know about this, and I didn't know about that, and he's got an episode on this. And so the the last series of episodes, including yours, have been more sales and relationship and skill set building for the entrepreneur, the small business owner, because and and it's it's becoming more cliche as I say this, is every walk of life is sales. You got to convince your wife to marry you. You got to convince that girl to go on a date. You got to convince the guy to sell you that car or give you that price. So every interaction in life as a human being is a sense of sale, mm -hmm. right? And, and if, Absolutely. if, if Absolutely. there, it, what's the thing is there's a, there's a, there's a sale on every transaction. It's just a matter of whether you're the buyer or you're the seller, but somebody, somebody's being exactly sold, your, right? You, you, exactly your wife says no. Who leaves with the receipt is right. the only real question. Right. Your, the your wife said no. She closed the sale. You're hoping for the yes. <laughs> so, well, sometimes yeah. it, it's, it's determined by who thinks they benefited more. That's uh, how that sometimes shakes out. But, you know, when you were talking about that piece of it, because the sales part of it, which for some people still is a dirty word for them, which I don't understand why, except let's be honest about it. Most salespeople are not all that great at it. And so what we do is we picture the guy with the plaid jacket on the used car lot, right. you know, with a cigar out of his mouth, anytime we hear a sales about a salesperson. But really it's about being able to have meaningful conversations where people can extract from the conversation how what you have can benefit them. 
you know, you talk a lot about insurance. I spent uh, some time as an insurance agent. And the very same skills that I used on the platform at a, you know, doing a keynote for 2,000 people were also involved when I was trying to talk to somebody about explaining liability to them. There are pieces to this. In fact, sure. one of the things that um, I was talking to one of my clients about, because coaching has also become a thing, unbeknownst to me, I, I never saw myself doing coaching four years ago. Now I'm doing coaching. Uh, and in one of those conversations just recently, I was talking to them about the fact that, uh, and talk of cliche, facts tell, stories sell. You've heard that a million right. times. But most people don't know how to put together a good story. So it's either too long or it rambles or th they think it's hugely funny and it's not. And at the end, the people are like, what? Why'd you tell me that? Well, it's so what, right? It's the yes, so what. Right. What's the well, so there's, what? So there's there's three th and three questions you have to answer for anybody if you're in a sales situation of any type, and you one of them is the one that you had. So I'm going to add a couple to it. Okay, three questions are what, so what, and now what? What, so what, and now what? So what is all about? That's the data. You know. If you're in a sales situation and insurance and date of birth, you know, where you live, all that, that's, I need to know those things to kind of figure out. The so what is, uh, if what is the feature, so what is the benefit? But it's bigger than that. The most successful salespeople, Bruce, are the people that attach a value point to every data point. So uh, I find out, for example, that your birthday is March 3rd. Um, and I'll, I won't pick a year because we don't have to worry about that, okay? 1840. But I'll find out your birthday is March 3rd. Well, sure, that's data. That I've got to enter in here for whatever application I'm filling. But if, I have, if I'm on my toes, I will also say, wow, that's uh, so you just had a birthday not long ago. Happy birthday. So even the simplest data point has a value point that's associated with it. Um, you know, I talk to people about that life insurance all the time. We, you know, we had a lot of younger clients. So somebody says that their birthday is on March 3rd, 1997. Oh, that is awesome. Uh, I've got kids older than you. That is really cool. But I will also tell you, before we get off the phone, I know you didn't call me to talk about life insurance, but I will tell you that it has never, it will never be less expensive for you than it is today. today. So we don't have to talk about that right now but be, I will be doing you a disservice. So you tie value to every point and the most successful, and the only way I can tie value, and I know I get a little juiced up about this, Bruce, the only way I can tie value to a data point is if I know you, not if I know me. Because hmm. um, the, the value points are your value points, they're not my value points. Uh, we were talking earlier about being unassuming when you talk to people. Right. That, to me, demonstrates humility. The greatest salespeople are not, they're just, they're confident, but they're also humble because they know it's not about them. It's about the person they're privileged to serve. Yeah, so lot, all of these conversations are exciting to me. Well, a lot of it is just paying attention, attention to detail and listening. We talk all the time on the show, two ears, one mouth. And, and, and I'm guilty of it is I, I do like to talk more sometimes, but, but I'm a damn good listener. Like I pay attention. And so I'm able to draw something back that they may have tossed out 35 minutes ago Absolutely. and, and have the opportunity to pull that back into the conversation. And if you're paying attention, you're like, well, how the hell do you remember that? Like, where, where did that come? Like he brought that, that, I mentioned that 35 minutes ago, but he stored that in there. And he sprung it on me when it opened up the opportunity to do it, right? You and that's attention to detail. Too, Bruce, they also remember that the other person that they spoke to that offered them something similar did not do that. Right. So it's not just what happens in this conversation. They are, you are now differentiating yourself from other conversations. Um, and that's huge. I mean, because yeah. there's a million people that do what I do and do what you do. Yeah, Why it, you is the point. 
I'm, I'm asked all the time, and I, I'm terrible at giving this answer. People say, "What makes you unique?" and "What you know? Why do people work with you?" and and, and I always respond in the sense, "Well, ask Greg why he works with me." Like I don't know. I'm not that self-aware, and I struggle with that. And maybe that's part of the humility and the humbleness side. But you, you just struck a chord because we were helping a couple of families with a transition. They they were on Cobra. They lost their health insurance. They're being offered Cobra, which was like super expensive and confusing. And they were speaking with others, and so they came to me with this hodgepodge of information. And they had correlated it all to the wrong answers, the wrong things, was a very large misunderstanding of it. And I had to kind of decompose what they had just been told. And they're like, well, you know, and then they started questioning what they were being told by those other people, because everything they were getting from my perspective was not the most accurate or best thing for them. And so I was able to, to... decompose it, if that's the right word, and then restructure it for them and then frame it for them. And they're like, well, why didn't they tell us that? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, but that's, but that's what I do. What did you say, Bruce, when they say, why didn't they tell us that? I don't know. See, that, those... And this, that's where, so this is now we're kind of just being me and you right now for a second. Yeah. But I think a lot of people, um, because I, that was something I struggled with as well. When someone says, well, why didn't they tell me that? Especially if it's someone else in your industry, that is a place of humility and help. So uh, why didn't they tell me that? You know, I'm not really sure why they didn't tell you that. And I'm in the same profession, and honestly, I, I apologize yeah. <laughs> on behalf of my industry for them not telling you that. But I'm so glad we got a chance to That's talk. right. Because we could put this in the right space. So I don't know why they did it, but I do know why it's important for me to, and that's the whole thing. You you can apologize on behalf of the industry so that you're not seen as throwing mud on someone Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I don't put anybody under the bus. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well, I I didn't hear you say that, but I, when next time when someone listening to this podcast and you, Bruce, when someone says, why didn't somebody tell me that? there's something that you can think about saying in response to that. Right. Because that is a place where imposter syndrome kind of kicks in a little bit. It's hmm. like, oh, I don't want to seem like I'm pumping myself up too right. much. Well, the, the fact is, in my business and in your business, uh, the most wonderful, powerful, longest sticking uh, lead from a retention point of view and the least expensive by far is when someone else puts your name in the mix for you as a referral or a recommendation. Uh, and Absolutely. I just wanted to pivot that back to, because we were talking about relationships and chaos, right? So pretty much everybody I work, have worked with over the, all that time, they understood what happened to my business. Even the people who called me to cancel did so with an apologetic tone. They were like, sure. I'm sorry, Greg, but you know, we just, and I wasn't mad at them. I understood what was going on. But the way we handle even moments like that translates into something that just, uh, I, I, this is a live example, Bruce. It just happened probably two and a half weeks ago. So I got a phone call out of the blue, don't recognize the number. I pick up, you know, it comes to my cell, so you know how we are when we don't recognize the number. Is it potential spam? Or so I just pick it up. And the person says, is this Greg Gregg? And I said, yeah, this is Greg Gregg, which is kind of funny because I answered with this is Greg Gregg. But anyway. Um, <laughs> See, no attention to detail. The guy that wears the bow tie. And I said, yeah, I am. She said, great. I've been looking for you. A coworker of mine that retired three years ago told me that when we put the conference back on, you're the first person I should call. And I That's asked beautiful. Bruce what was the coworker's name, and she said the name, and guess what? You don't know. I have no idea <laughs> who that person is. Beautiful. That's how a relationship can help you navigate even through chaos. Because the people who couldn't even do for me still found a way to right. do for me, even after they had retired. Um, so when we pour that kind of love, because that's really what it is, because love is a verb, 
when we pour that kind of love into our relationships and people know that we really have their best interest at heart and we're trying to serve them. Uh, my grandfather used to always say, your job is to be a good servant. That was his mantra, be a good servant. The world will reward a good sure. servant. Eventually, and, and so in 30 plus years, Bruce, uh, all that traveling that I've been talking about, 99.3% of all the business I've done has been referral in, 30, in three decades. I have never picked up the phone and called anyone and said, please hire me. It's never happened. It's amazing. That's what relationships do. Yeah. No, it, 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 for those who aren't doing business that way, it, it's certainly our preferred. I mean, our business is predominantly relationship referral based, whether it's networking partners, referral partners, strategic yeah. partners. But it's showing up. It's putting yourself out there. It's as you said, serving, and what what I like to to talk in that regard is the emotional bank accounts. Sure. And so, if you make the deposits in your relationships, their bank account continues to flourish and grow. Yep. You're giving, and, and I talk. I've talked at events, and my presentation has to do with never saying no to an opportunity, and how to build your own referral based network. And you got to give to get. And so if, if you serve and you give and how, what is Greg looking for and, and, and who's, a, who's a good contact and who's in my phone that I could immediately introduce him to. And so you keep giving and that karma definitely comes back because you're, yeah. you're serving your fellow person. And, you know, whether it's a chit, an IOU or an obligation, if, if I'm giving you three, four, five pieces of business, you're going to start sitting there going, wow, Bruce is really taking good care of me. I better start finding something for him, but he may find somebody else to give that business to. So there's a great book uh, called Influence, uh, mm -hmm. and it talks about the uh, different levers of influence. Yeah. And one of the most powerful levers of influence is reciprocity. And that's what you were just talking about. Yeah, is absolutely. That it puts a wonderful, glorious, sweet stress on a relationship yeah. when I do, but I do, uh, and someone's like, I got, I got to find a way, but we don't do it to do it because then it becomes manipulative. If I'm doing sure. it as you know, uh, uh, to to kind of coerce you into it, you know, Bruce, you know, I send you a lot of business. I notice you haven't sent me then that is a, that's a withdrawal in the emotional bank account, not a deposit. Right. But when you do it and you do it with the right spirit, it creates an environment that really makes it uncomfortable for people until they have found a way to say thank you in some shape, form, or fashion. Uh, you can also get a deposit, and you mentioned the emotion. I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey and Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That's one of my favorite books. It was a life-changing book for me. The it allows sometimes no, the word no can be a deposit as well. Mm. So How so? You talk to someone and you're like, I get what you're saying, but I'm not sure I'm the best fit for you. I have had, I've, and I know you, because sometimes it's just not a good fit. It's right. not a, that they're a bad person or you're a bad person. It's just not a good fit. I have had people, uh, when I have my insurance agency, there would be people that when we talked it all through and finished the quote, they were like, that's just not a good fit for me. And I'd say, I understand. Um, I appreciate, though, you giving me the opportunity to help you understand why and how you should be protected. And didn't write the business. And then three weeks later, I get a phone call from this person's uncle who says, I know you were talking to my nephew. I know he didn't, he's not in the space to do that, but so he just kept talking about this guy that was nice to him, even though he didn't buy anything from him. And we wrote the uncle's business. There you go. So it's all relationships, yeah. relationships, relationships. It works. It's, and by the way, it's not just the financial industry. It's, it's every business. business. It's, it's like you said, every, everything is sales, sales oriented, sales related. And you, when, when you just mentioned, there's another book out there. It's a quick read, Getting to Know. N O, not K N O W. Getting to know, and it, it's just as important 
to get your prospective client, customer, whatever they are, to the point of at least giving you a decision. Yes. Not You don't always need the yeses, but the I'll think about it and the I don't knows don't serve either side. Yep. And so, you know, people say, are you a good closer? The good closers help get through all those objectives and, and get behind what the knows are and will be somewhat relentless. And then as far as my side of things is, I just want you to make a decision, yes or no. Are you comfortable telling me no? If you don't think this is a fit, if I can't help solve your problem, ease your pain, find a better solution, if you don't think it works for you, Greg, are you okay telling me no? And we just part friends and that's fine because I'm not here to hammer you into a sale, not my style. But if I've given you everything you need and we've done our job and you we've connected the dots and if you just feel like, well, it, we're just not on the same page or it's, we can't find something in your budget or look, health insurance, I can't make, you know, insurance is insurance. Yeah, I can't control the pricing on things, right? So you, you, either, you either decide you can afford it or got to have it or you're willing to take the risks without it, right? right. Now, because it progresses, to yeah. the, the conversation progresses to some place. And, um, you know, we're talking about selling and, one of the things that I remember, I, it was kind of fun because I've been doing, have been doing all this training and teaching on selling and service and stuff, and then I had my own agency, which was kind of fun because it's like, let's see if this stuff really works in the real world in an insurance agency, right? And one of the things that I was talking to one of my team members about, uh, that they pulled me aside later, and they're like, I never thought about it the way you said before you said it, and. I was like, well, what did I say? Because it, you know, when we talk, sometimes Bruce is like, we are impacting people, and we don't even know how. Sometimes, yeah, so I said, exactly. What did I say? He said, you said that you would rather have people buy from you than you sell to them, and because when they buy from you, they have skin in the game. It is their decision too. Sure is only me selling, it's easy for them to back away because it's not their decision. It's not, they're not bought into it. And I think people who sell well, because it is, you know, a vocation, it is a job, are the people that have people say yes to it versus saying yes, just, just you know, the closer thing that you were just talking about. Um, the best way to close is to have someone close themselves. Yeah, say, absolutely. This sounds like the right thing for me. Or it does not sound like the right thing for me. Because, you know, I, I I'm you know, you can get into the baseball hall of fame with a you know, a three hundred batting average. Um, that makes for a pretty decent close ratio too, depending <laughs> on where your leads are coming from. So you're not gonna win all the time. Sure. But uh, you really only lose if they walk away from the conversation the way they walked into it. Uh, Keith Duterte, one of my mentors, used to always say in insurance, our job is to leave them better off. I like that. With a policy or with information, uh, leave them better off. And if you do that, that's what builds relationships at last that continue to um, feed your business and your life, quite frankly. Sure. I mean, we're, we're, we can only give them answers and solutions. They may not like what you're putting in front of them. They may not be able to afford it. And then to their credit, at least they did the homework. So yep. an example for us is we have a client in the health insurance space. His dad lost his job, doesn't have insurance. The son's helping pick up the bills. You know, dad's in his mid-late 50s. You know, obviously a son in his 30s with his own family is a stretch to take care of his father, <laughs> who's younger than me, by the way. Uh, I saw his date of birth. I'm like, oh, this guy's got grandkids already. <laughs> My kid's got to catch up. Uh, but but to to the point is, he's like, look, my dad's got a litany of problems. These are the doctors that he needs to see. Uh, you know, what can you do to help him? And so I'm, I'm putting it together and I'm checking the doctors. And, and I'm basically like, look, you've got two price points here. This plan is almost free, 40 bucks a month, but only half the doctors are in it. This plan has all the doctors in it, 
it's going to cost you $800 a month. What's more important to you? Seeing those exact doctors or spending $40 a month instead of $800? It's 20 times more. So the decision making is, well, maybe I could go find doctors in that network, in that plan to replace them and not spend $10,000 a year to see that doctor, right? So it's yeah. information and decision making. And that's what we're trying to cultivate with people is everything's about information. People are like, can you shop this? Can you quote this? Can you? I'm like, I need information. And so my job is to deliver that, disseminate that, and then put it in front of you in a logical fashion for you to be able to make a decision. That, uh, just, like that's, this that's A, B, all, C. It always boils down to. Right. It re, what you just said reminded me of a uh, story at, and, uh, that Tony Robbins tells uh, often about this young guy who was asking him, you know, what do you want? You know, what's your number, you know, that you want to be able to have in the bank? You know, what is that number? And, and interestingly, and you ask this question, I know of people and know people who do that. Most people have no idea what that number is. Which is why they're best. Which is why the profession is so important. <laughs> right. Um, but the guy gave this humongous number, and then he started asking, "So why is the number that big?" He said, "Tell me what some of the things are you want." He said, "Well, uh, I want to have my own jet so that I could go to this, you know, some island or something like that whenever I wanted to." And he kept asking questions, and he realized that he didn't need to own a jet. He just needed to be able to charter a jet. That's right. And and, and and that choice kind of reminded me of what you were talking about. It's like, do you need to own the jet, which requires maintenance and all these other things, these other costs, or are you happy enough to ride on exactly the same model jet and get where you go and charter it? And the, it just blew the young guy's mind because he had never thought of it that way. Our job is to offer options to people that lets them make a decision. That's what it's all about. It's framing and it. You got to frame it. It's that in education. I've got clients in education. I have, I've had um, the uh, National Funeral Directors Association was a client of mine, Bruce. And even in that space, it's about a decision. Even sure. in those spaces. So <laughs> uh, if you know the fundamentals, you can use them anywhere. A hundred percent. Everything should be framed, right? Framing, it, putting it in a picture, paint a picture for somebody, let them see it in in their way. Because again, that key to our success is it's not how I see it. It's am I putting it in a way that they can see it? Right. Like I get it. And, and you know, we, again, we, we have these interactions and a lot of times clients are just like, well, what would you do? Like they're so bombarded with this information and don't know how to process it. And thank goodness the trust, the trust level is high. And my, my friend called literally yesterday uh, that I've known since high school and she's dealing with her elderly dad and I'm giving her the information and I'm giving her the options, but it's not her space, right? She doesn't really understand the differences of what I'm showing her, sure. but she trusts me. And so the, an the, the response was, if it was your dad, which of these would you put him in? And I wow. said, this one, yep. right? So it's not that it's blind trust, but it's trust in the sense, but I've earned that trust. She trusts my knowledge and professionalism. And again, this wasn't a $15 million transaction, but the, the simple fact is what they were evaluating was too confusing for her to get into the weeds. Yep. And so again, our job as mentors in whatever space is, your clients may not have the capacity to interpret all of this information. And then if you've done your job, you know, here's a good so what for the show, is if you've done your job, then the trust is there where they're gonna basically say, well, which of these two would you do? And then- still, the, the, what, the beauty of what you just said, Bruce, is that they're still making a decision. Is to trust Bruce? Right, or not, not to trust, trust Bruce. That's right. <laughs> so it still boils down to that this is, it is, are you going left or right? And but that's the, like you said earlier, it's made easier because not what happened in that moment in time is because there was a lifetime of experience, well, even if it went back a long time where people brought that trust forward, right. maybe they didn't even speak to you in the last 15 years. It doesn't matter. 
it's the theme when you make a deposit that deposit is in pretty good shape well it's, a, it's the whole theme of the show it's relationship building so that relationship has been built maybe just in, in a monetary sense a penny at a time instead of a dollar at a time whatever that means right it's just you know it's small building blocks that over time even from afar if it's she's seeing me on social media or, you know it's not like we're at the reunions every year together or doing whatever but we we have the background enough a who's she going to turn to well i i i, I have a level of trust already built in so let me start with him and if he's not the guy maybe he'll get me to the person that that is so there's trust there right i run a trusted advisors group and that's the whole point is if i don't know i'm going to bring in greg i'm going to bring in robin i'm going to bring in joe and so i've aligned myself with those trusted advisors and so i represent that to my audience my audience knows they can come to me it's a value proposition and so in, in this case, she, well, can you help me with, yes, I can tell me what's going on, told me, you know, and, and we quickly took care of it and, and she's relieved and, and her 88 year old dad was relieved. Like it was lickety split once we, you know, got to that point, uh, boom, boom, boom. So, but it goes back to what you said earlier where the person calling you out of the blue because of somebody else's relationship or recognition of you. And, and folks, this is the whole beauty of relationship business generation the higher level of trust intimacy is already in place you 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 you're not cold calling and door knocking and cold canvassing and and trying to sell greg hit on it earlier is it's better for them to buy from you from a level of trust and validation than you coercing and arm twisting and you're 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 boxing in the ring trying to make the sale, right? Exactly. Oh, what about this? Right. What, you know, it's, that is not the best sales environment. Yeah, and, 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 and it's, it's what makes the car pro, car sales process so painful for people that they hate it because it's just gainsmanship. And, and I'll even circle back. I didn't get the point before is it, it, it that, that cigar smoking used car salesman in, in the plaid jacket – it, there's a reason he was considered sleazy and untrustworthy because everything seemed to be win-lose. And so you and I play from the camp of win-win. You can deliver a win. You know, what does Zig Ziglar say? You'll, you'll get everything in life you want if you help others get what they want, right? And so you and I both studied from him and Covey, you know, again, we go back 30, for almost 40 years in our space. But again, tools in the toolbox. We're students of the game. Greg and I evolved our businesses and our business acumen. We didn't wake up at 22 years of age with this knowledge, we sought knowledge and continue to add. So I deliver it in a sense of the finance and, and insurance world, and Greg does it in the speaking and coaching world and brings the same value props that you can apply. Mine's in a, in a daily routine of you know, finance, and Greg's in, in the application of the, the world and the interaction and business acumen and, and, and things of that nature. So I'm, I'm just keep an eye on the clock because I try and keep our audience uh, attentive and not nodding off. <laughs> so uh, let, let's just kind of start to bring in a couple of key bullet points on maybe some of the stuff that we haven't hit that you would wanted to share today as some key takeaways. I made some notes and I'm going to recap some of it as we wrap up, but what, what didn't we kind of get to that maybe is, is a couple of good so what ifs or things people can start to execute or, or maybe even seek you out for more help with so I would say uh, one of them you mentioned but I want to elevate because there's a bunch of things that you're saying and I was like I always think I hope that didn't slide by anybody yeah um, out of the chaos of spending time uh, looking at the four walls of my office for almost a year and a half you know what I understood that I needed to do more of read 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 you can gather decades of experience from Zig Ziglar by reading his books or by Stephen Covey or Tony Robbins or whomever. Um, the most successful people on the planet read a lot. So if you're not reading, I would read. That changed the way I thought about a lot sure. of things. Um, the other thing is that, you know, we talked about chaos and relationship building and stuff and the fact is that when you are 
if, especially for the entrepreneurs that are listening, not if you hit your moment of chaos, but when you hit your moment of chaos, because you will, understand that those relationships that you spent the time building will actually circle the wagons to help rescue you. Because people don't want to see people who've done well by them suffer or struggle. And they will, if they can't do it with their money, Bruce, they will go get other people's money and bring it to you. Sure. So um, those are the two things that stick out in my mind. I, I think we covered a lot of the rest of them in detail, but you know, read and understand when you hit your wall, the relationships that you have formed will help you get through that place and maybe even emerge uh, a different level of provider than you were even before. Well, thank you. Yeah, you, you hear about, you know, just read 10 pages or 10 minutes a day and, and you, you could read a book a month or, yes, you know, six, 12 books a year. And you know, the, 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 the ultra wealthy, the, the successful people, the, the Jeff Bezos and the Warren Buffetts, they read. They're always seeking knowledge and information and improving. Now, you don't necessarily have to apply all of that, but you might be surprised that extra nugget I'm sure there's one redeeming value in any book you read Absolutely. that you could walk away from. Even though it's 300 pages, it's that one aha in that book. That's all you need. It's a success. And so what you're doing is you're you're adding more tools, knowledge, information, and then you apply that to your day-to-day, -day, your routines. You know, again, it, it's th this is the stuff that's being talked about these days is, you know, 1%. Can you improve 1% a day? In a year, look how far down the road better you're going to be. You know, that one push of a day becomes two, becomes five, becomes a hundred, right? So it, it, it's, it's one foot in front of the other. You, you can't look at the mountaintop and say, oh, that's too big. I can't get there. It's just keep taking one step and one step. I've, I've hiked the Grand Canyon. Like it's three miles, five miles down. You're like, oh my God, I, I got to get out of there. Like, okay, well, it's one step, one step, one step, take a break, right? And just put in the time and, and grind. And there we are. All of a sudden we're back at the top. So, uh, so let me recap some of the things that I took away from today, folks. Hopefully you did. We're talking with Greg Gray about relationship building and how to handle the world of chaos and, and where opportunity comes from. Some of the takeaways I got was leave them better off than you found them. I like that from one of your early mentors. Uh, again, another one here. You want to have people buy from you versus selling them because it becomes their idea or their sense. And so it's win-win. It's not coerced. And you obviously eliminate the buyer's remorse where now they want to return it. <laughs> They're like, you know what? Forget it. Uh, especially in the world of insurance, you, you hear the drama of chargebacks because people got sold. And then when the salesperson leaves and they now he's telling the wife and she's like, what? And they cancel. <laughs> they cancel what you just did. Right. Um, and then we talked about influence and reciprocity, the giving to get right and helping in that regard and and i have audible I, i'm kind of into the audibles these days so i i, I need to re-listen to influence but i do have that on there uh and then the uh the getting to know right the, the power of no and the getting to know uh and then what i like certainly because i always talk from the point of so what but greg helped add to that the three questions really that go around it are what so what and now what and so i'm always asking the so what's but Greg's putting it in there for me to be better. That's my takeaway is, well, now what? So I'm giving you the so what, Greg, but so now what? Well, now we need blank, right? We need to do all of that. So um, so th those are my notes and takeaways. Any last... Your video all right there? It looks like it's breaking up a little bit. Here for some reason. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I, I got you. That's weird. I'm not sure what's going on there. Power outage in Atlanta. Uh, <laughs> stranger things have happened. So th I think I actually look better this way. No, no come on now. Distorted. <laughs> um, no, just a big thank you to you, Bruce, for putting on these podcasts and helping people. Um, you you are providing stuff to people that, in some cases, people have to pay tons of money to get. Uh, but you're a helper, and that's part of what you do, and you do it in an unassuming way. So it's just an honor to be invited. Oh, to thank you. you. In Very very kind. I'm going to share your information in the show notes, but why don't you give a, just a quick shout? Yes. How can people reach Greg you? Phone numbers, com. emails? G-R-E-G-G-R-A-Y dot com. 
Greg uh, Gray. Anything you need to know, contact information, topics. Uh, when I'm, uh, my head doesn't shake this much when I talk to people on a Zoom either, so I, I'm much more stable in that case. This, uh, this has just been a mind-blowing experience, Bruce. That's what's going on right now. This I don't know if you're being attacked by aliens or MTV has taken over your broadcast. I have, but it's this a has cut never of, happened to me before, but then again, moments with Bruce will always be different. That's it's, I'm, I'm just riding with it. I'm just it, riding It's with electrifying. It. It's electrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank my guest, Greg Gray. Go hit him up at greggray.com. Again, his information will be in the show notes. Uh, we hope you got some value out of today. Greg and I would appreciate you like, sharing, uh, providing commentary, looking up Greg if you need some assistance there. But again, this has been another episode of Ask the Plan Man. I'm your host, Bruce Weinstein. I have a belief everybody deserves a plan in life that institutes a multitude of different aspects. So come look us up at planman.tv if you're not on YouTube. Our website, asktheplanman.com. Give me a call at 844-PLANMAN. If you need some advice, always get it right. Come ask the plan, man. Until next time, Greg Gray again, thank you so much for joining us today. Folks, we'll see you next time. Thanks. When you need some advice, never sacrifice. Always get it right. Ask the plan, man. Finance, insurance, and more.